All right, thank you everybody for joining us today for this special webinar. We're excited to present to you this webinar about acquiring a complete view of road weather hazards uh, with the with the note on operating effectively, getting a, a complete view of uh, the weather that impacts roads so you can operate more efficiently and effectively throughout your operations. We have a couple of housekeeping items before we get started on introductions. Uh, this webinar is, first off, is being recorded, so uh, everyone is on mute. If you do have a question, feel free in the bottom right-hand corner of your, your side window there, there's an Ask Questions button. Feel free to send us your questions throughout the presentation. If we're able to work in the answer during the presentation, we certainly will. If not, at the very end of the webinar, we will give people a, a chance to unmute themselves or to raise their hands or we'll go through the rest of the questions that were not answered throughout the webinar. Uh, with it being recorded, we're also going to send out that recording at the end of the webinar. So if you uh, uh, miss something and want to go back and look at it, or if there was someone that you know that was unable to attend, or even someone that might just be interested in what we're presenting today, feel free to send that recording on to them. Uh, we will also be posting this uh, on, on various social media channels as well, too. So be on the lookout for that. We also, at the very bottom, there should be a handouts uh, section. We have a road weather buying guide that was recently released uh, by High Sierra. It's a really great dive into uh, road weather and the various solutions that are out there. Gets into uh, a, a lot of the products that are out there. Um, how those solutions can help you out and uh, gives a, a really great overview of, of the uh, road weather solution guide. So uh, if that's of interest to you, feel free to download that. I'll, I'll also remind people at the very end of that, that handout as, as well. So with that, uh, we'll jump into our speakers today. Uh, first off, we have Brandon Terry. He's uh, our Arwa sales director. Uh, he's uh, uh, and we'll get into the backgrounds in just a second. And uh, also myself, my name is Charles Jost. I'm the product marketing manager for uh, for High Sierra One Rain and the rest of the advanced environmental monitoring uh, business units. So a little background about Brandon. Uh, Brandon has been in this industry uh, working in the weather uh, space for the past 15 years. He's been uh, leading both flood warning and road weather solutions across a variety of uh, customer areas from, from small municipality governments all the way up to federal and, and state DOTs. Uh, we're, we're really excited to have him on today, and, and he brings a, a wealth of information about, uh, about what we're going to be presenting today. And so he's going to be digging into one of our case studies uh, that, that he helped to, to implement. A little background about myself. My name is, is Charles. I'm the product marketing manager. Uh, I, I help uh, deliver solutions uh, to the market, help to uh, uh, help bring our products and positioning out. I've been in the weather space since 2013. I got uh, some advanced degrees in, in weather and, and rainfall and uh, really excited about our, our road weather presentation today. So just a little kind of agenda uh, about what we're going to be covering. Again, we're, we're kind of focusing on getting that complete hazard view for all the, the weather hazards that it might impact roads. Uh, so we'll start off with, you know, just first off, why is, why is road weather information important uh, and, and kind of overall road, road hazards overview. Uh, might be preaching to the choir a little bit with those first two, uh, but uh, we, we think it's important to set that groundwork as we as we build off of that towards our complete road weather approach. And uh, we'll get into some field technologies that help to enable that complete road weather approach. And then Brandon will, will take us home with uh, a really in-depth dive on the city of Alexandria and the great work that, that they're doing out there. So when, when we think about weather that impacts roads, uh, there, we can kind of divide it up into, into three kind of main categories. There's the economic side. Um, you know, winter maintenance accounts for, uh, on average, about 20% of DOT's annual budgets. Um, and there's uh, you know, multiple billions of dollars that is lost uh, from trucking company, companies alone. And uh, not only to, to mention the amount of 
time that's lost from uh, society being stuck uh, in in traffic. And so, from a from a pure just number standpoint and budget standpoint, it has a humongous uh, humongous uh, impact uh, on on municipalities and their their ability to to fight winter weather and operate more efficiently. There's a, a really big environmental impact, and, and we're going to spend some time kind of talking about this, and, and Brandon will touch on it. Um, but because we're uh, treating and maintaining these roads, there's a huge environmental uh, draw. And so uh, a lot of the uh, – one of the biggest sources of salt into wastewater and, and stormwater systems is directly from – uh, wintertime maintenance and, and activities. And so as we try to operate more efficiently to help uh, reduce our economic impact uh, by how much material we're, we're using to treat, that's also directly uh, related to what that uh, environmental impact will be uh, from runoff and from uh, from chloride levels being, being applied onto the roads. So a, a really big environmental impact that's uh, directly tied to this. And, and finally is, is the societal impact, right? This is everything um, from, from accidents that might, uh, that might occur on, on uh, the way home, you know, during a winter storm, uh, or even just the, you know, inconvenience of uh, someone having to uh, show up late to their work uh, because of, uh, you know, an unplowed road or an unplowed sidewalk and, and having to walk there. Um, and then you know we, we get into the um, into the numbers of of a number of accidents and lives lost. Um, and over 20% of the accidents, over over five million accidents occur in the U.S. alone annually. Over 20% of those are are directly related to weather. And so uh, you know one in five accidents uh, uh, accidents and injuries and fatalities are directly re uh, attributable to weather influence conditions. So this is uh, a, a, you know, when, when we think about impacts of, of road weather, uh, we're, we're really hitting all the three categories, right? Uh, economic, environmental, and societal. So what what are those road weather uh, hazards that, that we're talking about? Uh, you know, the, the most common one is the one that's pictured here, and it's what everyone think of, thinks of when we talk about road weather. So when we, when we mention road weather, uh, you know, the average person as well as, uh, you know, the average uh, municipality public works director is thinking about winter weather operations. And that is everything from pavement state. Uh, what is the state as the winter storm moves through an area? Are we, or do we have a snow-packed road? Uh, do we have frost and icy road conditions? Uh, are we into more of a slush and, uh, and uh, wet scenarios? And the pavement temperature in coordination with, with precip helps to drive um, all of these uh, road weather hazards. This is a, a very well-known and uh, you know and studied and and budgeted area of road weather, and we're going to spend a little bit of time on this. Uh, but the other two areas that that often you know categories that I'm I'm mentioning here often get overlooked throughout uh, road weather. Um, hazard operations. Uh, the first one is, is flooding. Uh, water on road and the water level uh, has a huge impact on, um, on traffic throughput and uh, road closures and overall efficiency of road networks to operate. And these can be from you know, simple coastal flooding uh, or nuisance flooding all the way to flooded roadways where we have swift water going over a road. And we'll, we'll talk about this uh, in a lot more detail. The other categories when we talk about uh, weather-influenced hazards is uh, precipitation, water on road, just simply rainfall that has fallen. Uh, that is the, the number one cause of accidents uh, here in the U.S. is, is, uh, is just simply a, a wet or, or rain uh, pavement and uh, and, and, and leads to, to a large number of, of accidents and injuries annually. And then we have other, other areas that um, you know, often get overlooked as well too, including visibility and wind speed, which can have uh, uh, really um, big impacts to, to how a system can operate and uh, the, the response of the municipality to, to go out and, and operate with that. And so when, when we think about these road weather hazards here, 
you know, each each one of these, uh, while they might have some seasonality with this, depending on the part of the country that you're in, um, they all can occur and impact the roads and have the same or similar consequences for for the road network that you're responsible for. And so what we're going to be talking a lot today is a combined road weather hazard system. And what this does is it's a combination of both software and hardware working in concert together to provide the most value. It's going to detect uh, these these uh, weather hazards on the roads and then be able to alert and to warn the appropriate people, whether that's uh, the maintainers of the actual roads, uh, whether it's uh, uh, other departments within your group, or ultimately the motorists, and we'll, we'll spend uh, some time looking at that. These include things like winter weather sensors that we've uh, come to know, being able to detect that pavement state and temperature but it also includes things like water level sensors, uh, rainfall data, uh, getting regional wind data so you can start to detect uh, for approaching a high wind uh, or low visibility area, and uh, a central software that we're going to tie all that together with. Over on the right-hand side, we're showing some screenshots of the city of Alexandria, Vir uh, Virginia's, uh, their combined road, road weather hazard system. And they've, they've been implementing this over many years. They've had a very thoughtful and kind of deliberate approach to how they're, they're tackling all this. And uh, we're, we're going to spend some, some time really diving in into how they've attacked it and how their, their uh, combined system has, has been really effective for them uh, through the years. So, you know, how can we get this complete weather hazard view? You know, I mentioned we often just focus on the, the winter weather. Um, uh, when we talk about road weather. Well, the first thing is we're actually not getting a complete winter weather view. Uh, and we'll spend some time talking about that. Um, it's not just uh, the number of hazards, but also getting a, a complete uh, uh, magnitude and spatial understanding of, of how a winter storm is unfolding. And then that way we can, we can ultimately uh, respond and, and operate efficiently. The second is is understanding and tracking those those non winter hazards that that I'm calling them, but that are just as deadly and it's just uh, has just as big of an impact on on roads. And the last area is uh, is even extending that detection and that understanding and being able to alert uh, the motorists and drivers on roads so they can alter alter their behavior. So the first one we're going to dig into is getting a, a complete winter weather story. Uh, you know, the traditional approach or, or how the industry has gone about this uh, for the last uh, several decades has been through traditional pole mount ARWA stations. And what this does is it allows uh, tracking of pavement state, it has a full MET suite on it, and cameras to visually verify conditions. They're really accurate and reliable, and we can, we can store that data and start to understand long-term term trends with that. There's some problems with this approach, right, where we miss what's going on between these stations. And when we look at uh, a roadway uh, system, uh, you know, you, you might at the most have a couple hundred of these stations, and we're talking thousands of miles of roadways and trying to make decisions off of just, uh, you know, a couple hundred data points. And, you know, conditions and priorities change very fast when we're looking at winter winter weather and uh, its its impact on roads. And so, you know, the, the first way, um, you know, this is just a, a pictorial diagram. You can see we have our, our two kind of traditional pole mount ROS stations uh, on, a, on a road segment here. And we have two, two data points uh, that are recording maybe pavement temperature, let's just say. Uh, but the question is, you know, what's, what's going on between these two segments, between these two data points? You can see there's perhaps a dip in the road, and due to uh, maybe environmental factors or not having power or uh, road requirements, we're not able to get that data point right in the middle. And so when we're operating effectively and efficiently, uh, you know, we're, we're putting motorists and the system into, into harm. Um, and so what we want to do is, is get data points between that. And so the, the very best way to do that is to attach those same pavement sensors that can detect both uh, um, what the pavement state is uh, non-intrusively, uh, we can put those on trucks. And, uh, you know, we, we won't go through the full architecture, 
but we can connect this to the to the AVL system and to telemetry so we can send out all of the information that's occurring uh, between these stations as, as smartly as possible and uh, as well as sending uh, additional vehicle information. And so a, a system that ends up with just those two data points, now we can get actual readings, uh, road temperatures and pavement states between this. And this allows you to, to fill in those gaps. Uh, plow operators can focus on the road instead of having to um, to, to worry about transmitting uh, road states. And, um, you know, in, in this case, more data points equals uh, better decision-making power. You can, you can smartly understand how an event is unfolding uh, across an area um, by looking at more than just uh, single point uh, data points. And these, these systems can be attached to not only plow trucks, uh, but we can attach these to to uh, supervisor trucks as well as uh, non-road uh, maintenance crew infrastructure. So buses and police cars and um, vehicles that are out on the road, uh, no matter what the weather conditions are, to get that true understanding of what's going across the area. Uh, the, other, the other section that could help to fill in the gaps is, uh, is Arwis light stations. These are uh, lower cost sensors and, and stations, package solutions that you can attach to existing infrastructure, uh, and it removes the need for kind of the extensive requirements that, that we might have for, uh, for those traditional pull mount systems. So it's the same data, uh, but, with, but with less uh, requirements. So uh, we can deploy these quickly. Maybe we have a, a, a road segment that we're uh, having trouble with, and we want to we want to start getting data so we can proactively send people out to maintain the road, or maybe we're in a construction area and we're having really bad problems with uh, getting getting plows there effectively. Uh, so we can put these up in in either temporary or permanent solutions. So we can help to get the kind of complete wintertime operations uh, from the uh, uh, the environmental sensor side with mobile data and quick deploy uh, Arwis light or IoT sensors uh, in addition to our kind of traditional approach to uh, wintertime operations. So the, the next area is understanding and tracking non-winter hazard, hazards. And when we look at this, um, we, we could see flood fatalities, and this is uh, the flood fatalities uh, over the last, from 2010 to 2018. And we could see this truly is, uh, um, a, a risk across all of the states um, in the continental United States. And uh, of these fatalities that occur, over two-thirds of them um, occur with a driver in a car being swept off a road um, and, and, having, uh, and, and losing their life due to them driving on the road. Um, and in some years, it's, it's even higher than, than that. And so for, you know, when, when we think about road weather hazards and getting that complete view, um, the risk from flooding is is very real, and we need to be able to to be able to track that and proactively maintain those roads and warn the motorists as needed. Hey Charles, I think I think even this year on uh, in in just 2020, I think there's like 40 deaths so far. And we're just in August, right? And and over 50 yep. percent of of those of those deaths, right, are, are vehicle related. So, you know, flooded roadways is definitely a, a big a big issue right now. Yeah, and, and that's a great point. The, the state of Texas, uh, you know, went, went through a, a terribly cold winter season where they had extreme temperatures on the, on the winter side, and then they immediately went into, into flood season and, and having to, to quickly switch gears from a, a road maintenance and uh, road weather perspective uh, very quickly. And we'll, we'll talk about ways to, to get around that. So, you know, as I mentioned, uh, on average, 68% of deaths occur in cars and trucks from, from water. And so what we can do is we can, we can attach water level sensors at areas uh, where we have uh, known issues. So it could be low water crossings, uh, like a picture shown here, where uh, you know, we're, we're not able to build infrastructure yet, uh, like a bridge to, to help reduce uh, water flowing on roads. Or it can be even just nuisance flooding, right, that shuts down roads where it isn't swift water. Um, there's no potential for loss of life. Uh, but it could just be, you know, really localized urban flooding or maybe coastal nuisance flooding where we're just wanting to know what those water levels are so we can start to move uh, resources as appropriately to close lanes or close roads 
or even send that data on to uh, to commercial or private routing software to, to help to um, reduce uh, the risk or chances of people driving into these these flooded flooded uh, roadways. So water water on road and water level is a really big impact. And uh, these, this impact specifically kind of spans, uh, usually spans multiple departments. Uh, but, but we'll talk about uh, ways we can, we can uh, help to enhance that and, uh, and get a more effective solution. Uh, rain and wet pavement is, is a really big deal. And when we look at the number of accidents that occur um, annually, this is uh, the number one source of accidents uh, in the United States is, is wet pavement. And uh, we, we kind of end, we have this multi, multitude and multiplying a, a problem with this is it can, it, can, uh, it can onset very quickly and it could be very localized or it could be really regional and we can have uh, the entire system stressed all at once. Um, and so this, this can increase traffic and accident risks throughout, throughout the system. And so, you know, really the, the best way to go about attacking this is through gridded rainfall data that's been corrected to rain gauge data and looking at regional rain gauge data so we can start to see um, what's going on, uh, maybe approaching us or is there's new convective activity in your area, being able to pick that up and then using the what's called gauge adjuster radar rainfall to help fill in those gaps and understand uh, when we're first getting uh, water on pavement or uh, wet pavement scenarios, um, and we could start to notify alert personnel to uh, to either lower the the have variable speed systems in place uh, or to update dynamic messaging uh, signs throughout the throughout the system. And then the other hazards, uh, including high winds and, and low visibility, um, these these can tend to be regional and and have known trouble areas. Uh, but but again, these these can develop really quickly, and oftentimes this this has the the uh, stress of it it occurring uh, sometimes across the entire area, or sometimes just very locally on on bridges or areas close to water or mountain regions. Um, and so, getting resources out there um, often can take times to uh, can take take a certain amount of time to actually get the resources out there, close the lane safely or close the road segment altogether. And so if we can automatically detect this and get notifications when we're heading towards a high wind event or, or a low visibility event from, from fog or smoke, we can start to get a, a, a head start on these and, uh, as we'll talk about in, in, uh, on the next slide here, actually start to notify drivers uh, with flashing lights and with uh, dynamic messaging. So the last way is kind of taking a full circle. The first two are about detection and being able to, to actively go out and operate efficiently with your system. The last way is proactively uh, alerting and notifying drivers because ultimately with all of this, we're wanting them to alter their behavior. That, that helps to slow down or to, uh, to, to maybe take a different route or to uh, you know n not drive in one lane because there's there's water on the road. Uh, alerting drivers to alter their behavior helps to to reduce those numbers uh, while we're in the process of of uh, operating and maintaining those roads. So uh, you know we as I mentioned we can detect almost all of these environmental conditions, uh, and and we know when for example a a road or frost conditions might occur on a on a road or a bridge deck, um, but you know maybe due to location or the um, the speed or the risk to to agency personnel, we might not be able to get out there quickly enough, and we need those drivers and motorists to to know that and uh, to to alter their speeds. And here's here's kind of a a, a classic example of a of a, uh, a snow, snow uh, frosted or uh, snow packed road, excuse me, where, uh, you know, maybe this is a really remote bridge here and uh, it, it's a known trouble area. And just by having a sign that automatically turns on based on those road conditions uh, is enough of a trigger to a motorist that, hey, um, you know, I drive by this sign all the time and it's never, it's never on. And, you know, now I'm in this dangerous situation. I see those lights on. Maybe I need to slow down. 
And so what, what IC Road and IC Bridge warning systems do, this is part of our driver warning systems um, industry category, is these are automated systems. They're, they operate independent of, of humans. They can be overridden by humans, but, but for the most part, they, they operate autonomously, and they are constantly measuring the road temperature and pavement state, uh, and based on whatever calculations or thresholds or conditions that you want to alarm on, they can automatically turn on flashers, uh, blackout signs, or uh, even close gates, depending on, on the situation and, and what the need is. And obviously, all this is going to be reporting back to the central software. We can also do the same thing uh, as we're doing with winter weather and maybe an icy road or icy bridge deck uh, scenarios. We can also do the exact same thing with, with water on road, right? So the same infrastructure, the same system, uh, the, the same solution is delivering both wintertime warning as well as water, water on road and swift water issues. So in this case, we're measuring the water up to the road level. We can, we can automatically track that, send that data back so we know to maybe we want to go verify or uh, we can put a camera on the system to visually inspect and verify. But ultimately, we're going to be warning, warning the motorist by closing a gate if it's a, a known trouble area where we've had issues in the past and, uh, and turning on flashers uh, to get that, that extra response. So as, as we talk about, you know, increased detection on the amount of, of data for wintertime operations, uh, getting that, that full detection uh, uh, of non-winter hazards to understanding and responding quickly uh, and getting the most lead time or, or operational efficiency, and then warning motorists uh, when those conditions are met. Um, we we kind of have to bring it all together. Um, and so this is this is kind of that pitch for a combined hazard system, and which we'll talk about here in just a second with Brandon. But this gives us um, a single pane of glass view for all of these hazards, right? And what this does is it allows you to reduce costs, right? You're not operating multiple systems or software or, or uh, telemetry fees. It's all in the same same system. That helps to reduce the training time. If you're using the same system both in winter time and wet weather, you're using it year round, and that helps. Uh, you know, you're you're not having to re gear up every year and and to retrain the crew. You're continuing to use the same verbiage on alarms and the same uh, access points, and all your bookmarks stay the same. Um, it, it helps to reduce the the spin up time for whatever season you're going into, and it also allows you to quickly extend your deployment out uh, so you know a lot of agencies are starting to see that hey I you know I, I never had a water problem here before uh, but now I'm having it you can quickly deploy uh, resources and extend it uh, uh, based on how your needs are evolving over time and the best way uh, and kind of the, the end usage of this is having a central software that has all of it and, and Brandon will spend some time talking about how the city of Alexandria has approached this uh, but it helps to have a unified notification system, uh, same uh, visualization and mapping, and to view both the mobile data and fixed data and non-winter weather data all in one spot so you can uh, respond effectively and, and warn motorists uh, to alter their behavior. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Brandon. I'll, I'll invite him to, to, uh, to unmute, and uh, he's going to talk and walk us through how the city of Alexandria approach this exact problem. Hey, good afternoon, everybody. Um, thanks, Charles, uh, for the intro there earlier. Um, hey, lots of good stuff there that you went over. Um, you know, that's a lot of technology that we've covered, and some of the people on the call may have been familiar with that, but we always like to get a, a good picture and tell a good story. So, uh, you know, a lot of good picture of, of the big picture there. So, um, so how does all this stuff work together in the real world, right? You know, how do we make sense of all the technologies to, to make decisions? You know, we wanted to share a story uh, of how the city of Alexandria, Virginia, ha has used environmental monitoring technology uh, the past seven or eight years or so uh, to really optimize how they are uh, serving the citizens of their town. You know, like any other town that is, uh, you know, they're located there right outside of, of Washington, D.C., you know, they're located above that proverbial snow line, right, which, well, I mean, in the last couple of years, uh, we, we've had to rethink the way that line's drawn, right? Um, so, 
But anyways, you know, they have their challenges of, of keeping the roads clear and, and business moving as usual and keeping the general public safe. So just as you previously mentioned, Charles, you know, there's there's year round weather conditions that that are out there that are presenting challenges to the city. Uh, you know, they have uh, flooding, they have flash flooding, um, flooded roadways uh, in the wintertime. Again, you know, they have that window there where they, they do get uh, they get black ice. So in the springtime, really, they get, um, you know, periods where you it doesn't look icy, but it actually is. Right. Um, and then snow removal effect effectiveness and how to do that efficiently and cost effectively. We'll kind of touch on that a little bit. Um, they do get the fog of the Potomac. So that that comes to effect ar around the city. Um, even lightning, uh, you know, lightning kind of plays a little bit into roadway stuff, maybe for roadway safety, but they, we, there's ways to monitor that. Um, but the coastal and tidal flooding is a big influence of some of the stuff that we'll talk about, especially the, the wet weather hazards. So I think we'll, we'll, we'll kind of jump into the, the wet weather stuff. So, um, you know, a lot of water around um, Alexandria there, especially around um, the old city. Uh, you know, when it comes to wet weather hazards, the city's environmental program, monitoring program, it was actually born from, from these types of challenges that, that the wet weather hazards present. Um, you know, the area has a ton of concrete and hard surfaces. It's uh, that lots of highways through there. Um, so, you know, runoff is, is quite fast. Um, you know, this makes the area susceptible to having what you call a higher flash flood guidance than usual. Um, you know, making flash flooding a, a very big threat. Um, for those folks that may not know what flash flood guidance or FFG is, um, basically um, flash flood guidance is an estimate of amount of rainfall that's going to fall over a certain time period that may cause small streams to flood. I mean, that's how the National Weather Service defines it. Um, you know, these estimates are based on uh, the current soil moisture, the soil type, uh, and the current stream flow conditions for the area. Um, flash flood guidance is usually... Um, that's usually issued by the National Weather Service's River Forecast Centers and, and is used by the, the weather forecast offices that are local to the area when they issue um, flash flood watches and warnings to the public. So anytime usually you're in, a, in an urban area, you're going to have uh, less rain required to reduce a flash flood. So to kind of compound the problems, right, so you know, we got coastal flooding too, right? So if if the Chesapeake, say it's in a high tide or a king tide, and then the Potomac is a tidal basin influenced body of water, you know, you get a double whammy, right? So it's like flooding on both sides of the equation. You may have a strong thunderstorm and a high tide, and then this this in turn creates, you know, issues with, with flooded roadways. Um, you know, there's some really particular heavily traveled roads um, that um, have travel inhibited quite a bit when these events occur. Uh, the picture on the screen here, um, is actually uh, right outside of, of downtown Alexandria. Um, it's um, the flooded roadway system. Basically, it was designed to uh, notify motorists. We call them um, high water detection systems or HWDS. Um, you know, the particular system that, that closes off the, this particular roadway um, is uh, Eisenhower Avenue. Um, basically, it's a motorist notification with beacons, uh, measures waterways uh, on the Cameron Run. And, and lets the people know with via beacons that it's flooding. Um, so when, when this started taking place, they had some flood events in 2013. In 2014, they introduced the high water detection system on Eisenhower Avenue at Cameron Run. And, and data is measured there with a, with a radar level water sensor. Uh, it's mounted on a bridge. And the data from that system actually at that level, uh, they share that data um, over with the folks in Metro. Um, the, the Washington Metro Group actually has a train yard right adjacent to this area. So when water level actually gets up into the roadways, we turn on lights, but we also have levels that we notify the people at the Metro that, hey, you might want to cut off uh, some electricity or, or move trains due to the flood water. So um, that, it's a, a neat little section there. Um, again, the, the flood warning system there in um, Alexandria was uh, a, a fir first put in as a, as a project owned by the emergency management and the fire rescue group. Uh, they were needing something to get out there to help prevent or mitigate having to go pluck people out of the water, right? Um, Ray Watley, he's the emergency manager there currently in Alexandria. Uh, one of the main things that he really likes uh, about the system is that he's able to close the roads in an automated manner 
without having to go and have people, you know, set up a fire truck or, or put out barriers or barricades. And, and this drastically helps reduce uh, the amount of resources that he has to spend um, during an event when he could use his assets to go and maybe plug people out of water in places they don't yet have systems. So that's a, a big, big plus for him. Pays for the system, he says, in, in one rescue. Um, you know, shortly after putting in those uh, those systems over on, on Eisenhower, they had some additional flooding that happened. And so they decided to get kind of a heads up, you know, let's let's supplement that system and find out what's coming down into the area. So they added up some additional sites um, up on Backlick Run and then up on Holmes Run. So those two bodies of water actually come together to form that Cameron Run. So, you know, having a proactive heads up of, hey, we're seeing a rapid water rise on those bodies, you know, those little streams that they can, you know, then anticipate maybe that road's going to close off and maybe they can turn the roads on. If it's a, a giant flash flood event, it's, you know, it's a really fast moving water. So, um, so they added sites there. They also put in some flashers there uh, around the, the, the Van Dorn uh, roadway. And uh, that works uh, it's just up the street from the picture you see on the screen here. Um, they, they notify people that, hey, it's, it's going to flood. Um, hopefully now that the system's in place, they're having a public site that's coming out. We'll talk about in a few minutes that um, they'll be able to put out notifications to folks that, hey, you know, this water's coming up. If you live in the area, you can subscribe to that type of stuff and get your car out of the way in case it's going to flood in there. So it's a, it's a pretty cool feature that's coming down the road from those guys. Well, uh, moving on down, you know, they are hitting, uh, you know, the winter weather season coming up. You know, it's just around the corner, right? So they have those challenges that, that they have to deal with. Um, the city themselves, they're responsible for uh, clearing the town's roads, not, not Virginia DOT. So these guys need as much information as possible to, to kind of handle those tasks, you know, efficiently. And at the same time, be cost effective, right? Charles talked earlier um, you know, about the environmental impacts, you know, without the ability to, to measure sensors, you know, measure the, the road with sensors and, and know when to get out and how effectively you are treating, you're going to continually put down additional chlorides and salt that may not be needed um, as you have a, a very sufficient friction um, and, and condition going on. And, and then you won't have to have an additional cost of, of that environmental impact and additional cost on your resources. You can see on the screen here, uh, there's a, a picture of a non-intrusive surface condition sensor there on the, uh, on the light pole. Um, that's what we call the ice sight sensor. So that's a, it's a non-intrusive surface condition sensor. It's going to give you surface condition, pavement temperature, air temperature, relative humidity, dew point, a couple of good parameters to have there in weather, winter maintenance. Um, so we put five of these guys well, in 2019. They stuck five of these around different areas of the city, some on bridges. Uh, some in areas that have some hills that they have some issues, like they have some stoplights on these hills, and they want to be able to make sure those are treated nicely to allow people to get plenty of time to stop with uh, the red lights. Um, you know, those are providing the friction values, again, that are super uh, important for them to get out and, and treat. Um, so, you know, it, it, again, conversely, these sensors, not just for, for winter weather tasks. I was going to budge in on Charles earlier, but, um, you know, these things are great for slippery when wet right? Because they can give you that the pavement's wet in the summertime, but it can also give you that friction value. So it's, it's kind of a, a dual, dual season type sensor, right? It's not just, just the winter weather that it's viewing, right? So you can get, um, you know, hey, the surface friction has dropped down to like, like 0.4, maybe you get a little oil on the highway. It's just, it's just damp. So you can, you know, activate, you know, notifications on DMSs that, hey, slipper room wet, please slow down, be cautious. So for the group that's, that's using the, the, the non-intrusive surface condition sensors, uh, the Division of Roadways, we got Bob Garbax. Bob, is, he's the division chief there for transportation. And really, he's, he's one of the big winners here, right? So he's getting all the information he needs from, from both the winter weather hazards and the wet weather hazards. And, and, and used to having to like send folks out. So you know, they were for a while. They were sending folks out. They would they would use their their trucks. They stick their arm out the window with a laser thermometer. I was talking to some of the public works guys, and they no longer have to really do that, right? They're getting a, a comprehensive picture of, of of surface temperature from their sensors. 
Um, and even during the wet weather events, right? He is he is saving resources because in the past um, they used to have to go out and and look at water on, on an hourly basis just to kind of decide if they're going to shut a road off or not. And now it's all automated, so those resources are freed up. So he's getting a pretty good investment on on his return for what he's put in there um, in the city. Uh, okay, so jumping back over to the wet weather hazards. Um, Obviously, Alexander, they do have some winter problems, but they do have huge wet weather issues that go on there. Um, there was a very significant uh, storm or rain event back in September of 2020 um, that caused some pretty extreme flash flooding uh, within a couple of watersheds around the city. Um, in a late September meeting after this event, um, in the city council meeting, uh, Mayor Wilson so the city is, is too late to prevent the problems. You know, unfortunately, when people come to testify at these um, at these hearings or these council meetings, it, it's basically our capital infrastructure has failed. So it's like, you know, it's 10 to 15 years too late for the city to be making any kind of preventative investments for those concerns. So, um, you know, these unusual type of storms, these these uh, very intense storms are happening much more frequently. You know, that he's, he's telling the council that, you know, we've got to figure out a way to be able to measure those, right? This is a how do we make the kinds of investments in our infrastructure to be able to monitor and notify people when these events are happening or could happen and ongoing? Um, and the challenges are happening all across the city. So they've had a pretty big uh, push to be able to begin mitigating these uh, type of events. Um, you know, he thinks, he says that his residents are expecting it, they're demanding it. And, um, you know, this is one of the most basic services that they can provide to the community. Um, you know, Alexandria's infrastructure actually is only designed to handle a 10-year type storm event um, or a rain event such a volume that, like, okay, so we say 10 years, people are like, well, this happens only once in 10 years, right? Well, it's actually more of a probability, right? So uh, it's a rain event of such volume that it only has maybe a 1 in 10 chance of happening in any given year. That's what a 10-year event mark means. Uh, over the past uh, 14 months, uh, Alexandria has actually had three storms that have significantly passed the 10-year mark. Um, I think for Alexandria, their 10-year uh, storm event is a storm that actually drops to a little over two and a quarter inches of rain in an hour, or it's a little over four and three quarter inches for a 24-hour period. So, you know, how, how do they monitor these types of events, right? So um, you can kind of see hanging out in the timeline there as we're progressing here. Um, there's a, a, a precipitation and a water level monitoring gauge there. And the city recently, just this year, um, added um, eight additional level water level and precip gauges um, and, and a public web interface to inform citizens about flooding. So uh, that's a really recent uh, thing that's happened. It's, it's still in, in progress. and and we're helping them uh, get that out and, and publish to the public. So we're, it's, a, it's a work in progress. Um, so, you know, these these sensors that they've put out there have become super beneficial when it comes to, to capturing some rainfall, right? Um, you know, these additional stations have allowed them to become even better at, at, in their rain data collection and in their flood warning resiliency. Um, and, you know, and additionally, to the rain gauges, so if you remember in the heat map that we just looked at, um, there's some rain gauges on the screen there that um, you can see have been placed in those locations where previously there, there weren't sensors, right? Um, all the sensors were located on the western side of town, up around um, uh, Homes Run Parkway and places like that. So the rain gauge, uh, you know, density wasn't very good in the town. Um, so they, they actually went twofold on this and went all in. Um, they added additional rain gauges, they added stream gauges, but they also added in um, gauge adjusted radar rainfall that Charles talked about earlier. Um, you know, and that basically they're doing um, uh, rainfall basin averaging and, and forecasting, right, to get a better picture of how the watersheds are performing during these events. Um, you know, we're talking about how um, we're going to say uh, out two hours out from an event, we've had some pretty intense thunderstorms. Uh, we've had a little break here, but in looking at the forecast that could come in, in the next two hours, they can share that data out that the stormwater group has put in out with the emergency management division. And they can also share it out to the transportation group. So they can have advanced warning to impending heavy precipitation that's going to exacerbate what's already gone going. So um, they're 
they're they're adding stuff from different divisions, but it's helping out everybody across the whole collective good. Brian Rawl is actually the guy who is help um, helping lead the charge on this adding of of stormwater uh, gauges. Um, you know, he is a, a big proponent of using the gauge adjusted radar rainfall to uh, manage what's you know understand what's falling across the entire city at a glance. Um, he it provides reports and things like that. He works for actually. He's in the public works, but he's in the environment, uh, Department of the Environment. So they, they do a lot of reports specific to that. Um, you know, his group, um, they did pay for the infrastructure upgrades of their existing flood warning system that was on an old technology called Alert. And, and folks on the, on the call here may not be, that's in the road weather world, may not be familiar uh, with what Alert is. Um, Alert was a protocol that was uh, developed back in the late 70s um, that was to develop a, a sensor that could report in real time. Well, the old system, if you had a real heavy event, you could possibly have what you call data collisions. So the, the city wanted to be more robust. They upgraded to the new technology called Alert 2. And what that does is it allows all the gauges to be on GPS-based time. They're synced up. They can send engineering units. It's a really robust protocol that operates over VHF. Um, so you're not susceptible to rain fade like satellite systems. Um, so they use this VHF type system, right? And, and it's, it's really robust and they get uh, error correction. So they're getting 99.9% .9 of the data that happens in an event. So that's a huge upgrade over what they had. Um, the system is really real time. So when um, this system happens to get a trip in the field, um, you know, with less than five seconds, that data is going to be in their database. So they're getting that uh, that uh, almost a real-time situational awareness of what's going on from the weather sensors and the precipitation networks, which is really cool. Um, you know, and this can be used, the, the GAR product that we talked about, you know, gathered from this system can be used to trigger emergency crews, you know, and road people in the events that could uh, possibly cross roadways and, and whatnot. So again, I, we're kind of jumping back on this uh, slide that we saw earlier. Uh, again, Charles picked the we picked these screen sets shots up off of their system. You know, they have that combined weather system, right? It's a huge team effort where the stormwater division, the public works, is working with the road department and public works, and then the emergency management folks are in all in concert together, and and it's a very harmonic system. And they're using that central software, the central software, uh, you know, as that magic piece that allows them to be in harmony and in their decision making, right? They've got a ton of data coming in from different different systems and they're able to, to look at it, you know, mobile based or, or in the traffic management centers and, and make those decisions that, that helps serve the public the best, right? Um, they've got, uh, you know, a total thing, right? They've got winter weather sensors, they've got uh, water level sensors, rain sensors, uh, rain gauges, um, they're even pulling in data for the system from the USGS. So there's there's other systems that they don't even own that they can get data from. Um, even their neighboring networks, like Fairfax County, they have a similar type of network. They can they can actually take the data from the bigger network that's to their west and northwest, and pull that data in to help see or foresee what's coming their way to make decisions. So having the central collection software is one of the one of the main pieces of that puzzle to allow that complete solution to work uh, in there in, in Alexandria. So, um, you know, that's going to wrap it up for the Alexandria case study. You can see they, they're, they're continually progressing and adding and trying to do what's best for the public there and kudos off to them. Um, I think now we'll move it over kind of to the takeaways and let Charles take us home on those um, and then we'll kind of open it up for questions. Okay, thank you, Brandon. And uh, just just as Brandon mentioned, we're we're going to open it up and answer some questions. Wanted to leave some time for for everyone to get their questions in. There is a little bit of a lag, so go ahead and uh, while I'm going through the takeaways, please send in your questions. Send them through the the questions box or the chat box, and then that way we we have our questions uh, ready for the for the final section here. So from takeaways, these are. They're, these are pretty obvious, and they're just kind of help to summarize what we've been working on here. Uh, so, you know, getting more winter data um, in in more locations, and then you're uh, quickly changing things around to to either changing priorities or evolving uh, road systems helps to drive better and faster decisions. So, when we're talking about the impacts from roads, uh, both uh, economically, socially. 
um, or environmentally. We want to be able to, to be smart about uh, how we're maintaining and treating our roads and deploying our resources. And the first thing is by getting more data um, and being able to be flexible in, in that data with, with where and how we're getting, getting that information. The second, second kind of main takeaway is, is uh, through alerting uh, drivers of those adverse conditions. We're not going to be able to get out there uh, and, and uh, be able to, to get to every single trouble location, um, especially in areas that, are, that have a large geographic spread or areas that have multiple troubled areas. Uh, so having systems that work autonomously and independent of a human, uh, you know, waking up at 2 a.m. to go close a, go, go close a lane or close a road, um, driver warning systems can help to alter that behavior so people don't drive through flooded roadways or they slow their speed uh, for a, a icy bridge deck, um, you know, in, in the middle of a, a winter storm that they're, that they're driving through. Uh, and and not forgetting about these non-winter hazards. These are these are key. And you know when we look at uh, number of accidents and even loss of life that a region might experience, a lot of it comes from these non-winter hazards. You know road weather. Uh, you know is rightfully focused. You know on reducing those impacts in the the winter weather season. But we do have a lot of non-winter hazards that occur, and uh, these things can be seasonal and can, op, can occur independent of each other, uh, but it truly is a, a year-round issue of, of uh, um, reducing the risk and uh, increasing public safety uh, for everything outside of just winter, wintertime weather. And if you think about it, Charles, some of those, some of the biggest wrecks you've seen on the news lately have been some of those visibility-based wrecks where you have, you know, multitudes of polyps on the on the interstate that ends up with a, you know, chain reaction type rear end event, and those can be quite devastating as as we've seen the last uh, year or two. Actually, there's been a couple. That's that's exactly right, and and you know the the last kind of key takeaway, and then I'll I, I have one or two other ones as as we wait for questions to trickle in here, uh, is is a central software that helps to bring all of this together, right? You you can have these systems, um, and that's that's uh, great, uh, but being able to pull it all into one system really helps to kind of elevate the effectiveness and uh, and and how you respond and and uh, work through these through these hazards. It offers you a, a single pane of glass view uh, that helps to reduce costs, uh, reduce the amount of training that has to go into both maintaining and operating these systems, and allows flexibility in how you deploy and respond to your changing risk environment. And Brandon mentioned this earlier, but we're starting to see um, events and hazards occur in parts of the country that just are not used to seeing that. And so having a, a single system uh, that that's, uh, combines all these hazards into one uh, platform allows you to, as things are evolving in the years to come, to be able to respond and deploy uh, to those changing hazards over time. And, and the, other, the other key part of that, too, is being able to switch quickly back and forth. Uh, you know, with, within a, a month or two span, uh, Texas had... Uh, freezing cold uh, temperatures, uh, deadly uh, low temperatures, uh, icy road conditions, and snowfall, uh, and then immediately went into uh, into drought and then into into flooding scenarios for their for their roads and low water crossings. Um, so it's not only just seeing new hazards; it's the speed uh, changing between these hazards is is really critical. And so having a common solution allows you to go from uh, you know, a low visibility event to a um, to a, a flooding event uh, w without uh, skipping a beat. Well, I and seen so any, with I, that, I haven't seen any questions come in. Uh, you know, don't be bashful, folks. We'll be glad to. We've got a few minutes here. We'd be uh, glad to answer anything you guys have on this uh, on this content. So, please. Shoot us, shoot us. Uh, if you don't want to ask a question here now, here's our emails. Um, you know, give us, give us an email. We'll be glad to to get back with you and, and answer any questions that you have in, in regards to what maybe the city of Alexandria is doing, or or maybe how the uh, how we can get you and going with some some complete weather monitoring tech. That's that's perfect, and uh, it doesn't 
It does look like we have uh, one one question came in uh, asking about does the system receive push updates, automatic updates on how the system is running. Um, so that, that that's a great question, and and I'll I'll give a first pass at it, and uh, I, I can let Brandon uh, take a, a swing at it. So you know, your your question is exactly right, and it's something we we uh, kind of skipped over, but is important when you're thinking about designing these systems, is being able to maintain them to ensure that they work correctly in the future, especially when you're driving mission critical decisions off of this. Um, you know, it, it's not just about uh, applying the right amount of material. Once you start getting into to flooding and, you know, icy icy road situations, you're, you're really making critical decisions and, and warning. So uh, both uh, pushing updates uh, and notifying the correct personnel um, about how the uh, event is unfolding but also you, you, you need a system that can detect if there's uh, a problem with the hardware or these systems. You know, these are, these are real world systems out there, um, you know, especially in wintertime operations, they, they can get dirty very easily uh, and you can start to get some spurious data. Um, and so having a, a system, both hardware and software, that can detect when something is wrong and notify you um, or be able to detect a trend that, that something is not working. Uh, and what that does is it, it helps to reduce the, the downtime of, of these systems uh, from, from a maintenance perspective. You can proactively get out there, uh, fix the issue, uh, or replace it, uh, or at, you know, at a minimum, turn it off so you're not making, uh, or making or not making uh, the correct decisions for those. Um, and so uh, tech support is, uh, is kind of up to the agency. Uh, you can do it in-house uh, or there's uh, uh, third-party providers, including High Sierra Electronics, that, that does exactly that, that can come out and maintain those stations, uh, both uh, either one-time maintenance trips or, or an annual contract for uh, continual maintenance to make sure your system is operating uh, year-round. Brandon, yeah. did, I, did I miss anything? No, you hit it all. I think, I mean, the central software, of course, I mean, all your software, um, that stuff's vetted and tested, and then it's pushed out at a certain time during the month. So their central software is going to be, um, you know, updated automatically. Um, out in the field, again, we, we, we run diagnostic tests. We have heartbeat signals that come in from these systems that give us a diagnostic on what's going on on a daily basis. So you do, like, you know, Charles mentioned on the maintenance, uh, we, we get that daily report of what's going on. Uh, in the network, so if we have to get out there and fix something, you know, we can. So that's it. it it's it's kind of twofold. Some of the stuff that's out in the field uh, is VHF based, so it's kind of hard to, to to send updates that way. Uh, we do have stuff that is cell connected, so you can send updates and do some stuff that way. It's 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 a little it's a mixed bag, but um, but yeah, it's 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 really easy to get reports out to know what's going on. And, and and then do the, the annual maintenance. You got to keep this stuff clean to work, as Charles said. So if it's if it's not clean or it's not uh, you know maintained, you're not going to get the best data possible. So the the other thing I'll mention, and it's kind of slightly related to that, is is on the design of these types of systems. You know, Brandon walked through the city of Alexandria. This was a multi-year process, um, and it was primarily driven by the hazards that they were facing and what their priorities were especially from kind of the, the upper leadership from the, the mayor's office down. Uh, but depending on your location and uh, what your hazards are and maybe how they unfold and how your environment changes that um, can really drive how these systems are implemented, both from a priority perspective, but also how the technology is designed and implemented out, the, out in the field. We have a wide variety of sensors and telemetry and deployment options as we kind of walk through. And you know whether you implement a system with gates or flashers, or what type of water level sensor, or what type of road sensor you're using, or uh, you know whether you're using fixed mobile or light, or you know how you deploy those, or um, you know especially in areas that can have both remote and uh, uh, tough geographic features, having a kind of clear plan also helps to um, you can design it so you can extend it over time but also design it to where uh, you, you have a lot less impact from uh, in, in, uh, impact to maintenance. So that, that's really critical and important design uh, can, can help both on the kind of budgetary and, and admin side, but also helps reduce the amount of maintenance trips 
and uh, to, to ensure the system works, no matter whether you're in a major flooding event or a major uh, ice event, uh, having the system work um, through that is really critical. Well, I think, uh, so that brings to the top of the hour. Um, you know, uh, that was the only question that got typed in. Please, if you have any other questions, you, you see our email addresses right there on the screen. Shoot us, a, shoot us a note, shoot us a question. We'll be glad to get back with you. We want to thank everybody for taking an hour out of your day today to come join with us, learn a little bit, um, seeing what other folks are doing is always a good way to, to kind of get an idea of maybe what you want to do in your town. So really appreciate your time today. Uh, also, please, uh, if you haven't grabbed it yet, please grab the uh, road weather buying guide uh, PDF there at the in the handout section um, in the in the bottom of the the window there. Uh, I'll be glad to answer any questions you have uh, going through that as well. So, thanks everybody. Um, hope to see you guys on our next uh, webinar. Thanks.